In another era, in another time, it would have been a shock that echoed around the world. On August the 30th, 2023, military officers appeared on live TV in the oil-rich African nation of Gabon to announce that they'd overthrown the president in a coup. As one of the continent's richest countries on a GDP per capita basis, the deposal of leader Ali Bongo should have been unthinkable. Had it happened a decade ago, it would have been one of that year's biggest stories. But not in this era. In 2023, the world reacted to the coup in Gabon by effectively saying, seriously? Another one? Somehow, the 2020s have become the age of coups in Africa. In the last three years alone, there have been nine successful military takeovers in seven countries. Of all the successful coups worldwide since 2017, only a single one in Myanmar has been outside of Africa. Now that makes a serious question. Well, why? Why does Africa seem to be returning to the era of strong men in military fatigues overthrowing governments on a bit of a whim? Well, in today's episode, we're going to examine the recent wave of power seizures in Africa and asking where might be next. Now, reversals of fortune rarely come more whiplash-inducing than that suffered by Ali Bongo on August the 30th, 2023. That day, the results of Gabon's election were finally announced after days of counting. According to official tallies, Bongo had won another term as president of the third since his taking office in 2009. Not that the victory party was going to last very long, though. Barely an hour later, ordinary Gabonese watching TV were treated to a sight that's become depressingly familiar in parts of Africa. A group of officers stood before the camera in fatigues reading a statement. According to the military men, their nation had been suffering to quote, irresponsible, unforeseeable governance that has resulted in the steady degradation of social cohesion, which risks leading the country to chaos. We have decided to defend peace by putting an end to the regime in power. And with that, Gabon became the latest in a long line of African states to experience a recent military takeover. Beginning with Mali, seven nations on the continent have now suffered coups since 2020. A list that also includes Sudan, Guinea, Burkina Faso, Chad, and Niger. Two of them, Mali and Burkina Faso, even managed to experience multiple takeovers in a single year. Others still, like Guinea-Bissau, the Gambia, and Sao Tome and Principe, were targeted by coup plots that failed. In short, history seems to be repeating itself in Gabon, almost like all those involved were actors taking the stage in a pre-written play. As with the recent Niger coup, the Gabonese generals placed their president under house arrest. Just as ousted President Mohamed Bazoum did in Niger, Ali Bongo used social media to ask the world for help, in this case by releasing a video. And just as in Niger, the public seemed to celebrate the military's actions. In the hours after the takeover, the Gabonese capital of Libreville was filled with ordinary people cheering the generals on. Now, we'll be diving deeper into the seeming public support for Africa's Pushists in later chapters. For now, though, we just want to quickly note that in Gabon, at least, it's perhaps not all that surprising. While Ali Bongo had been in power since 2009, his family had ruled the country for a combined 56 years. Back in 1967, his father, Amar Bongo, became president only to abolish the opposition and turn Gabon into a one-party state. Although opposition parties were later reintroduced, Amar had by that time become a deft hand at buying off his nation's elite, using Gabon's vast oil wealth to keep himself in power. When he died in 2009, Ali Bongo took over and carried on ruling in the exact same vein, only now now hoarding even more of the country's money. As a result, Gabon wound up being one of those weird countries that are super rich on paper, but simultaneously shockingly poor. One third of its 2.3 million citizens lived below the poverty line, even as GDP per capita became one of Africa's highest. All of which may explain why ordinary folks seemed so happy about the coup. The election Ali Bongo had just won had been marred with irregularities, and the secretive counting of the results reinforced the impression that the whole thing had just been rigged. Regardless of the differences with other takeovers, though, the international reaction was the same. The African Union suspended Gabon, just as it had Niger, Mali, Sudan, Guinea, and Burkina Faso. The regional grouping Gabon was a part of, the Economic Community of Central African States, followed suit. Outside the continent, France, the EU, the United States, and the United Kingdom all condemned the takeover. China called for peaceful resolution. Yet none of it seemed to make a difference. At the time of recording, coup leader General Bryce Olegunagema has declared himself transitional president. A new constitution has been promised, as well as elections, and a return to civilian rule within two years. 
Whether any of that is actually going to happen is another matter. Jedra the Gamer is a distant cousin of Ali Bongo and hails from the family's stronghold of Hort Agu province. Already, there are signs that the coup will simply wind up extending the rule of the same discredited elite. Despite all of this, though, it's not really the Gabon coup that we want to talk about today. Rather, we want to use this coup as a springboard for investigating the recent return of some African regions to gun barrel politics, to examine the wave of coups that seems to be slowly spreading across the continent's western centre. Because if analysts are right, then Gabon may not be the last. It could be that a new era of military takeovers is on the way, an era uh, which would have important ramifications for the entire world. Across most decades of recent history, reporting that a coup had happened in Africa was up there with reporting that the sky was blue or that phantom blood was inferior to battle tendency. It was just a fact of life. According to political scientists Jonathan Powell and Clayton Thine, from 1950 to January 2022, there were 486 coup attempts worldwide, with about half 242 being successful. Of these, a full 106 took place in Africa, the most of any continent. Even coup-prone Latin America only racked up 70 in the same time frame. Yet as the 21st century got underway, things began to change. Across the 2000s and 2010s, forced transfers of power began to trend downward in Africa. While they never fully vanished, they hit a low over a decade ago, to the point that those that did happen were really big, unexpected news stories. If you were the hopeful type, you could believe coups might eventually vanish altogether, that the age of military strongmen seizing power was definitively over. But, well, not anymore. In the recent years, the downward trend has sharply reversed. Since 2017, Africa has seen 17 successful military coups, while the rest of the world has seen only one, Myanmar in 2021. Of those 17, nine have taken place this decade. As UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres remarked in 2021, military coups are back. Still, for all we've spent most of this section so far talking about Africa generally, this resurgence isn't affecting the entire continent, but rather a specific part of it. A part that is joined together by history and language as well as geography. A part that's characterized by its colonial ties with France. Of the seven African nations to so far experience coups this decade, all but one of them, Sudan, are Francophone countries. Writing before the Gabon takeover, the BBC noted that, quote, Since 1990, a striking 78% of the 27 coups in sub-Saharan Africa have occurred in Francophone states. That is a staggering number, and one that calls for a closer analysis. What is it about the French-speaking parts of the continent that seem to invite these coups, and why aren't they affecting the English, Portuguese, or Arabic-speaking parts to the same extent? For some observers, the answer lies in France itself. During the scramble for Africa, there wasn't really such a thing as a benign colonial power. While some were worse than others, hello, King Leopold II of Belgium, all were pretty exploitative and all were pretty awful. The big difference was that when the colonial era ended, some powers disengaged more fully than others. France, in particular, seems to have a hard time letting go. Paris continues to engage with many of its former colonies, often maintaining strong economic and military ties. For supporters, this is a sign of the country engaging in mutually beneficial partnerships with swaths of Africa. For skeptics, it looks a lot more like neocolonialism. State-backed French companies, for example, are often dominant players in resource extraction. In Niger, uranium mines were controlled by Arano. As Gilles Yabi wrote for Carnegie Endowment, some of these companies have been accused of improperly dumping waste, leading to long-term environmental and health hazards. Nor do they often employ locals, meaning it's French expats who benefit from the jobs that they create. At the same time, the French military has a track record of propping up corrupt pro-France leaders. If you want evidence, just, well, look at the recent coups. When anti-French military hunters took over Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, Paris was up in arms. But when the pro-French general Mahatmat Idris Deby Itno unconstitutionally took power in Chad after his father's death, there was barely a peep. 
Economically, too, France has often exerted a strong influence over its former colonies. The CFA franc is a currency that has been used in much of West Africa since 1945. Yet, as Deutsche Welle points out, it's controlled by the French Treasury, giving Paris huge power over any nation using it. It's only been since 2020 that legislation has existed to end the CFA franc. Now, to be clear, we're not trying to paint France as a uniquely bad colonial power. I mean, I am British. If anyone wants to look up the awful stuff my country did in Africa, there are whole books on the subject. What is unique about France, though, is both its ongoing closeness with its former colonies as well as how Paris is perceived within those countries. In much of Francophone Africa, France is currently about as popular as something that a dog left on the sidewalk. Fairly or unfairly, a lot of these coup leaders portray themselves as heading anti-French uprisings. Interestingly, this is naturally true in Gabon's case. Interim Prime Minister Raymond Ndong Sima told the BBC that Gabon would, quote, keep its close relationship with France. Still, as important as the francophone aspect of these nations clearly is, it's not the only thing that's leading to so many coups. There are a myriad of other factors at play too. After I did not have sexual relations with that woman, the most famous phrase associated with Bill Clinton was probably, it's the economy, stupid. Well, what was true for the American presidential campaign of 1992 is doubly true of modern Western Central Africa. In a recent deep dive into what was behind all these hunters, Bloomberg identified one primary driver, a set of economies that have recently taken an unholy battering. Looking at Sub-Saharan Africa as a whole, the piece noted that GDP per capita peaked back in 2014, an era when successful coups were comparatively rare. Per the article, it has since fallen more than 10%. In the same period, global GDP per capita has risen nearly 15%. Now, the reasons for this are legion. Bloomberg cites an over-reliance on commodities, rising borrowing costs, and the continued economic fallout from the pandemic, among other things. But the results are clearly visible. To quote the same piece again, African finance ministers are having to make impossible choices between paying the salaries of civil servants, keeping schools and hospitals open, or compensating foreign investors. People are fed up with governments failing to improve conditions. Now, many parts of the world are facing miserable economic headwinds without all plunging into coups. But what may be making parts of Africa so vulnerable is the behavior of the elites. Speaking to Deutsche Welle, Nigerian analyst Ovigwe Agugu pointed out how little the rulers of Francophone countries had done to improve their citizens' lives. Just think of Ali Bongo hoarding oil wealth, Alpha Conde, who seemed more interested in changing the constitution to remain in power than improving people's lot. As Agugu told the broadcaster of ordinary people in these nations, for them, the coups are seen as a way to shock the system to see if that could lead to a much better outcome. And it's here that we see another a related problem born of elite corruption, a corresponding slide in faith in democracy. Now, we don't mean democracy as some abstract thing here. Polls taken across Africa routinely show that most citizens consider democracy the best possible system for their societies. The trouble comes when you get down to how democracy is implemented in any given nation. Although it sparked a backlash, Guinea's president isn't the only leader who won legitimately, then gamed the system to ensure that he could henceforth never lose in Cameroon. Paul Beer openly rigs elections. In Zimbabwe, Emerson Mnangagwa pulls stunts like redrawing voting districts at the last minute and terrorizing opposition activists. And all of this serves to discredit democracy in the average citizen's eyes. As reported in Al Jazeera to quote, according to a 2022 poll by Pan-African Research Network Afrobarometer, only 44% of Africans say elections enable voters to remove leaders the voters do not want. Again, this problem is not unique to Africa. Cambodia is meant to be a democracy, but just had a dynastic transfer of power more like something from a monarchy. And if anyone thinks Alexander Lukashenko genuinely won the 2020 election in Belarus, well then I have a bridge and a bottle of gullibility that I'd love to sell to you. But the deteriorating economic situation is what makes this so combustible in Africa. And unlike in previous decades, this time there's a little bit of outside help. While foreign aid made up 4% of sub-Saharan Africa's GDP in the 2000s, the IMF thinks it now has fallen to about 2.5%. 
At the same time, the massive Chinese investment that characterized the 2010s has all but evaporated. Bloomberg's piece notes that Beijing lent $28 billion to African nations in 2016. Since 2020, the annual sum has been less than a tenth of that figure. Still, while the economic argument is certainly a part of it, it's not the entire answer here. For one thing, uh, what's true of Francophone nations in Sub-Saharan Africa is often true of Anglophone ones, or those speaking Portuguese. Yet, so far at least, the rise of military takeovers seems to be a mostly French-speaking phenomenon. Luckily, figuring out why may not be so hard. According to some researchers, you might even be able to sum it up in a single word. Contagion. When talking about coups, a lot of experts seriously dislike the word contagion because it ignores all the other factors, structural and personal, that factor into any takeover. But we've got to say, as shorthand, it's honestly pretty useful because just as with certain types of crimes, there seems to be a clear link between one coup succeeding and others following. To complete the metaphor, you even have vectors of transmission, the coup leaders themselves. What's often skipped over is just how close many of those heading military regimes in different countries are. They've often gone to the same academies, or studied combat under the same French experts, or gone on joint training exercises where they've gotten to know one another. So, for a military man in Niger, hearing about a coup in Burkina Faso isn't like you hearing about it. It's more like, oh wow, Bob did a coup? <laughs> That's a good idea, isn't it? How about that? Now, look, obviously we're oversimplifying here, but the basic concept is serious. Just as another major factor is, whether a given society has already survived one coup attempt. Just as catching COVID might leave you vulnerable to long COVID, so too can an attempted military takeover leave a lingering sickness in the body politic. One that makes the afflicted more vulnerable than they would normally be. Political scientist Jonathan Powell has documented how a previous coup, whether successful or not, can increase the chances of the military having another go. As he told Vox, if you've had a coup attempt in the last three years, controlling for a bunch of different factors, there are various studies that point to your probability having a coup in the current year to be something between 25 and 40 percent, which is really, really high. To illustrate, just look at one of the most famous military takeovers of all, the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat that brought Augusto Pinochet to power. While everyone remembers the successful overthrow of the Allende government, few remember that parts of the military had already had a go. On June the 29th that year, tank regiments rolled into the capital and tried to take over La Moneda, the Chilean White House. The attempt was a failure, but it left Allende's government badly weakened. And this is important in today's context because the nine successful military putches in Africa this decade have been accompanied by several failed ones. If Jonathan Powell is correct, that means that we're already at a stage where several West African nations are at high risk of future takeovers. In the last three years alone, Sierra Leone, the Gambia, San Tome and Principe, Guinea-Bissau and Central African Republic all fended off coup attempts. That doesn't mean each of those nations is now fated to a future of generals in khaki making solemn late-night statements on TV, but it does suggest there is a heightened risk that Gabon is not the last, especially when you consider how little blowback some of the other putschists have received. We mentioned earlier how France has been selective in its response to coups, cracking down on those perceived as anti-French while turning a bit of a blind eye to those that serve its interests. Well, just know that Paris is not alone. The European Council on Foreign Relations has documented failures by the African Union to enforce its own anti-coup rules since 2008. In Mauritania, Egypt, Chad, and Sudan, the AU effectively went along with forced transfers of power, even as it condemned those in Burkina Faso, Niger, and others. The ECFR's point is that rule enforcement needs to be consistent to deter generals who want to make themselves president. But even loose AU enforcement may not be as dangerous as what happened in Niger this summer. Now, if you're a regular watcher of this channel, you'll know that we actually did a whole video on the Niger coup and ECOWAS's threat to conduct a military intervention to restore democracy. At that time, we were worried that an ECOWAS intervention in Niger could lead to a quagmire or have unforeseen knock-on effects for the nations involved. What we didn't predict was that the regional bloc would ultimately let its ultimatum expire without taking action. For other putschists, the failure to force Niger's junta from power was likely a signal that they'd get away with it too. While ECOWAS is still said to be weighing intervention, the bloc currently looks too weak and divided to stop more coups. And that is a major deal, because the rest of the world certainly isn't going to stand up to military takeovers. In many cases, it might even facilitate them.
Now, there has been a lot written recently about how the age of a unipolar world is over, how the economic might of the combined West has diminished enough to allow the emergence of newer powers. But it's only when you look at stories like these that you start to realize what that might mean in practice. A couple of decades ago, at the peak of American might, the US could reliably use its power to corral the world into isolating a new hunter. As the ECFR explains, backed by Europe and the African Union, Washington acted as a powerful deterrent to anti-democratic forces. Today, though, that no longer holds true. Today, there are plenty of newly confident middle-tier powers that are happy to lend a helping hand to military putschists as a way of expanding their influence. Most obvious among these is Russia. After Mali kicked out French forces following its coup, it invited the Wagner Group to take over security, an invitation that, perhaps unsurprisingly, led to a sharp spike in civilian deaths and human rights abuses. Clearly, that model has all gotten a bit messy since Wagner's attempted insurrection and Prigozhin's assassination. But while there are question marks over Wagner's future, it's clear backing hunters can still reap dividends for Moscow. For one thing, Wagner were heavily involved in resource extraction, controlling things like gold mines. For another, Putin pretty openly wants to use anti-French sentiments in Africa to turn the continent against the wider West. It's not for nothing that some celebrating Niger's coup were waving Russian flags. But while the Kremlin sees military takeovers as a good way to weaken America and Europe, most other middle powers simply see a good way to make money. Turkey is one such case. Despite being a member of NATO, Ankara has sold its military equipment to post-coup states like Mali and Burkina Faso and is reportedly exploring tentative cooperation with Niger's junta. Unlike the US, Turkey sells its arms with few to no conditions attached. Unsurprisingly, this is attractive to military rulers who want to access advanced tech without paying lip service to stuff like human rights. Alongside Turkey, Gulf powers are also getting involved in Africa. The UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar are all backing their own horses in Sudan civil war, for example. The point here is not so much the emergence of these newly asserted middle powers, so much as how it makes isolating a regime effectively impossible. Whereas not so long ago, the West could force a junta to schedule new elections by cutting off their access to weapons or supplies, nowadays, that same junta can just get on the blower to Moscow or Ankara. That makes discouraging and punishing coups a hell of a lot harder. Look, by this point, though, we've had four chapters of analysis on what may be causing the wave of coups. As hopefully is clear, the reasons are many, uh, they are complex, and they may not go away anytime soon. All of which helpfully leads us into our final section, the part where we cast our eyes across the rest of Africa and wonder where's going to be next. <laughs> So, if there's one thing we've learned in this video, it's that you really, really don't want to be an unpopular leader in a francophone African country with a weak economy right now. And while it's a mugs game to try and predict the future, we can at least highlight who should be sleeping a little less easy in their beds right now. The Financial Times recently did a long, detailed article on the subject. By their reckoning, the leader who should be suffering the worst insomnia is Paul Beer of Cameroon. As Cameroon's former prime minister turned president, Beer has ruled the mostly francophone nation since 1975. Now aged 90, he spends most of his time away in Europe and has reportedly tried to arrange for his son to succeed him on his death. Or as Oxford Economics Africa analyst Francois Conradi summed up to the FT, he's an unpopular president who's been there for decades. Indeed, Beer is said to have sacked many of his military top brass the same day neighboring Gabon's coup was announced. Supposedly, this was a planned reshuffle, but it's not hard to see it as a preventative measure. Yet if Beer appears particularly vulnerable, he's not the only one who should be worrying. The same FT article also highlighted Chad, Togo, and the Republic of the Congo as places that might be extremely prone to military takeovers. In Chad's case, the current leader, Mahatmat Idris Debi Itno, already came to power on the back of a coup after his father's death in 2021. Since then, there's been at least one additional attempt at a military takeover. On top of that, leaders of forces fighting in both Sudan and the Central African Republic are said to be hoping to seize Chad for themselves, meaning Debi is facing multiple potential threats. The Congo and Togo mean Meanwhile, both Francophone nations with unpopular longtime leaders where the public might back a junta seizing power. Further down the list, Senegal is another former French colony that has seen public unrest in recent years. 
Yet it's not just the Francophone countries that might be vulnerable. If we apply some of the criteria from our video to other regions, then it's clear the problem could be wider than anybody would like to imagine. Among the former Portuguese colonies, Sao Tome and Principe and Guinea-Bissau both recently fought coup attempts, which may be a harbinger of future instability. Among Anglophone nations, the Gambia and Sierra Leone are in the same boat. And while Spanish-speaking Equatorial Guinea last suffered an attempted coup in 2018, so probably too long ago to still be destabilizing, it's also ruled by an autocrat who's now been in place for 44 years and is deeply disliked. Still, we want to stress that these are only places where a military takeover is a possibility, not a certainty. It's entirely possible that Gabon will turn out to be the last African nation to fall to a junta, and this chapter will wind up looking absurdly pessimistic in retrospect. On the other hand, it's impossible to deny that the era of coup d'etats in Africa seems to be returning. To be coming back into fashion at an alarming rate, even as polls show continued support for democracy. By making this video, then, We've hopefully given you at least some clue as to what to look out for, some warning signs that may indicate a nation is prone to a takeover. Because with First Niger and then Gabon this year, it seems like such hunters are set to become a part of our political landscape, men in khaki who seize power and declare themselves ruler at the barrel of a gun. And that makes it more important than ever to understand why these coups are happening, so we can, hopefully, prevent more governments from falling to military control in the first place.